Pascal Zogby, who lives and works in Madrid, where he runs his type foundry 29LT. His multi-script approach encompasses Arabic, Latin, and beyond. Today, he will take us behind the scenes to explore the process of creating an Arabic typeface, from historical research to finishing a complete system. Pascal earned a Master of Design in Type and Media from KABK, and he has taught design in Lebanon and the UAE. He has won many prizes and co-authored the, the book um, Arabic Graffiti. Please welcome Pascal. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm so honored to be in typographics. I will try to take you into the exciting and bit scary moment a type designer feels before they, uh, they start on a certain type project. So there's always this, this phase when I finish a type uh, project and I want to start a new one. I feel like I'm like, I'm like frozen in time, I'm floating. I don't know what's going to be my next type project. So when I went to Lebanon by, in my last trip uh, in, in spring, I said, okay, um, let me try to find something there. Maybe something will spark up some ideas. And I decided to go check the archival material in the Catholic press. And I was lucky that I, uh, I met with my, uh, with my previous teacher, uh, John Kurtbewe. He used to be the, uh, my, my teacher and also used to work in the, in the Catholic press between the, in the 70s and 90s in, in Beirut. And from the archival material he showed me, this popped up. It's one of the Berthold uh, Arabic uh, type specimens. And I was looking through it, and I noticed that I know this typeface from somewhere. I have seen this scene and this meme in it. And I just remembered that in 2007, like 15 years ago, when I was teaching in NDU with John, we went and visited a press and I remember that I went and I saw this uh, typeface within some of the lead type. And that's me uh, without the beard, maybe like 15 years ago. And I, I remember that I, I have placed my name, so this is my name in, 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 in Arabic. And back then I have bought nine uh, cases of Arabic. And they were like stored in my house, but I didn't know the value of them. They were like this full of dust, like layers of dust to them. And so I went back and I thought like, I know this typeface. So I went back home and I took out these cases and I cleaned them. And it is the same typeface that I saw in this type specimen. And I was like, wow, like this is like mind blowing. Like I'm going, like there's something about this typeface. Like why, why, why is it popping out? Why is it important? And then. I started looking at the ha, at the scene, at the meme, and how sharp and crisp it is. So what I did is I cleaned it. I took, I tried to pick the best uh, letter that I have from this set that I have uh, in my place in Lebanon. I put them on the stick, and I said, okay, I'm going to take them with me to Madrid, and I'm going to try to print them and try to make a research. Maybe I can inspire to come up with a new typeface from this. So. But back then, I didn't know much. So I, ah, and I also remembered that when I was teaching at AUB in Beirut, uh, we made once a research about Arabic letter set from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I searched through it, and of course, it popped again, and it says Nasakh Bertold. And this is the same typeface, because I look at the scene, and the ha, and the meme, it's the same. So it seems it was an important typeface back then. And at this stage, my, my brain is running. Like, I'm not anymore like floating, I'm like running, I'm like, I'm like obsessed, like what's this typeface? I need to search more about it. So I go back to Madrid and I start making some research. Uh, researching online was not very uh, easy, but then I was lucky and I came to the article of Dan uh, Reynolds. Um, he's a, um, a renowned uh, type designer researcher uh, he did his PhD about the uh, printing press in Germany uh, uh, in the 20th century, or between late 1800s until 1950, something like that. And in his article, I noticed that there's one of the mattresses, and if you zoom in the mattresses, this is also the same typeface. It is called Arabic bold, uh, half bold number 49. And I was like, what? Like, 
it's it's crazy. Like all of this information are pouring in. So I contact Dan, and I thought Dan like will not answer. Like he's busy. He's like, it will take him like two or three months to answer. But then he answered me like the next day. Literally, he answered me the next day, and he told me, look, this is very interesting, but I don't have time to write it down in an email. Why don't we meet in Zoom tomorrow? And I tell you all about it. And I was like, what? You're going to meet me like tomorrow and tell me all about it? Like, amazing. I'm, 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 I'm so grateful for that. So I met Dan, and then he's like this open encyclopedia. He started speaking and speaking and speaking about Bertold, about what was happening in 1950s, about uh, what happened with the archive material that was taken by the Technique Museum in Berlin, and who is the person responsible for it, and what happened uh, with all the different history. So I was amazed. I was like uh, watching like a series, and I want to hit the next, like next episode, next episode button, like please, next, 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 next. <laughs> give me more, give me more information. So, <laughs> and then told me, okay, you have to contact uh, Kristen and Marcel uh, from the Technique Museum in Berlin. So I was also like, like I said, okay, I will write them. He said, don't be very like optimistic. It might take them time to answer, but just write them. Uh, we don't know what is archived and what is not archived. But um, so I contact Tristan and Marcel. The thing is that the museum cannot share any kind of, uh, any kind of information publicly if it's not archived and cataloged. So, uh, and most of the stuff that they have in the museum, they are in storage, and uh, there's a part which is cataloged and it is in the museum. So Dan was a bit uh, saying that hopefully they, they archived stuff. And of course, I was lucky enough that also they answered me the next day. They were super nice people. I'm so grateful for Kristen and Marcel. And Literally, like within two days, she sent me photos of all the mattresses of this number 49, Arabic 49. So these are all the, this is all the character set of the, of the typeface. So now I know what is the character set because in Lebanon, I, uh, I wasn't sure what are the letters, what was missing, what was present. And Marcel sent me this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, sheet. And it says there's three binders that covers the Arabic stuff from the Berthold. The number uh, 1204639, 399, 400, and 419. And he said, uh, unfortunately, these are not uh, digitized. So you need to come to Berlin to scan them. But, uh, or if you have someone to come by and scan them. So, okay, um, look, listen, um, I'm looking at this. I see that this one says number 49, and this is what I want, because there's also number 50 and 32, uh, which are a bit different typefaces. But what I, what I was super impressed by was number 49. And he was kind enough. He told me, OK, I will just scan a few pages. And if it looks interesting, then maybe ask someone to come from Berlin. So uh, uh, there's a missing slide here, but there's no problem. Uh, so he sent me some, he sent me some scans, and it like it showed that there is some some drawings, there's some uh, letters between Bertold and people from Egypt and from Beirut and from other uh, cities in the Arab world, uh, and there's some test prints. So I contact my 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 contacts in Berlin, and the uh, I was lucky that uh, one of my contacts, uh, Ben Whitner, who has the studio PS51 in Berlin, he said uh, the museum is actually five minutes around the corner from our office, and we would be happy to to help you out. So they went there, and they scanned the the binder one two four six three nine nine, and this is what was in it. So there was like these. Um, uh, like this is the first test prints that they, that they did. They were the whole character set also test printed and different point sizes and different corrections. Uh, this is again the old character set with the basic set ligatures and supported uh, extended Arabic uh, uh, set. And these were the uh, letters. And from the letters, we noticed that there's two important people. There is a person called Salim. Uh, Al Habshi uh, from Egypt, and there's another person called uh, Michel Michel Sergi from Beirut. 
But we didn't know who were these people. And I was trying to search who is the designer of this Arabic number 49, uh, because it feels that it has a very special character. It's not like any other. It's, 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 it's a bit different than what was happening with Monotype or Linotype or the others. And Bertolt, you have to remember that Bertolt, they were selling their own typefaces to compete with Linotype and Monotype, but they were not selling it with the machines. If you, if, you, if you remember that Monotype and Linotype, they were selling a whole pack, the machine with the, with the, with the typefaces. Bertolt, they, don't, they didn't have the machine. They, so I believe that they were trying to make a, a more competitive design to have the client buy their funds for the design itself and not for the workability of it. So I, I thought that they should have worked with a very uh, modern designer uh, or person and I was suspicious if it was Salim or it was uh, Sergi, but we didn't know much. So here you see that there's some drawing and then it's, it's signed down, Salim Al-Habshi. So, uh, so this is him and it shows here in the, in the name and the, in, the, in the binder. So I make some research about Salim Al-Habshi and it turned out that he's a surrealist artist from the 40s to the 60s in Egypt, and he was doing this kind of art. And it's like, wow, amazing. Like, wh what's, what's that? Like, I was expecting like a, like a calligrapher or like a uh, te technical guy working with machines or like an engineer or... So I said, okay, uh, so this is his biography. Of course, I'm not going to read all of it. But the most important part that he is, he is, he was based, he, uh, he came from uh, Indonesia, he, he, he moved to Egypt and Netherlands, but what is important is that uh, in the 40s he came back to Egypt and he studied, uh, he made a diplomat in calligraphy after he finished his studies in medicine, and then he went to Netherlands between the 49 and 53, which was actually just before uh, the, the sketches that we saw, that we saw before, they were dated 55. So it was just the years before. So I spoke to Dan and he then was like, oh wow, that is a very likely hypothesis. He might have met Bertold in the Netherlands when he was there because they were, uh, Bertold was a, um, a partner with uh, Letter Gitters, this Dutch Amsterdam type founder and it most likely that they met there. And then I said, okay, whom else can I, can, I, can I ask, like from these experts? And I thought that of asking Sam Bardawil and Til Philharts. They are, they are uh, expert um, uh, curators in the art uh, scene, and they, did, they, are, they are behind Art Reoriented, and they did a book uh, called uh, L'Art de Liberté, uh, which speaks about the surrealist artists in Egypt between the, the uh, 38 and 48. And in it comes up the name of Salim al habshi So I contact Sam, and Sam gets back to me, and it says, again, the same response, like, most likely it is the same al habshi We are not sure because I don't have any documents to prove it, but we know that he was an avid calligrapher, and he used to design the catalogs of the group that was there in Egypt, the Suez group. And the other people that I thought that I might contact is Bahia al habshi and Haysam Nawar, because they wrote a book recently about the history of graphic design of Arabic graphic design, which is, um, it, we didn't have much books before, so this is uh, like a pioneering book in itself. And I'm sort of asking them, I have the book, I checked it, I didn't see him, I didn't see him neither in the index, neither in the section of this uh, period of time. So I contact them and he told me, no, we don't have it. We don't have any information about him, but we're going to ask the American University of Cairo to check in their archive and I'm still waiting for a response from Bahia and Haysam. Hopefully they will find something. But just before coming to, to, to the conference, actually three days ago, Krista wrote me again and she told me, look, listen, we were going back to the storage material and we find this binder called 14372. It, it didn't have a number because it wasn't numbered. So it was just numbered three days ago and they gave it a name 14727-32702. <laughs> Arabic half bold original design and it says on it original design it's like okay so this is the designer so now we are we are sure who's designer and it has all of these nice drawings to it and of course all of these drawings 
they were all signed by uh, Salim al Habshi. So now we have like more proof that the designer of uh, Arabic half bold uh, is Salim al Habshi. We still we don't uh, we believe that he's the same Salim al Habshi as the surrealist artist, but it's not proven 100% yet. So imagine this guy Salim al Habshi. He's this like uh, no one no one knows about him like. Uh, this is like an addition to our history, like our because of course he was maybe known back then, but now not not much. But I am I'm imagining he he should have been a very like uh, forward-thinking person, like to do such a typeface in the 50s, and he's also a surrealist artist drawing such paintings. So I was like amazed by this person, and I was like uh, I was so happy to find this kind of information, and it will give much more reason for me to spend an extra one year or whatever to revive this typeface and to give it a new life in this digital medium that we live in. So, so what, do, what do I want to do with this finding that I found? So, so back in Madrid, uh, uh, I spoke to my, uh, to my new friend and colleague in, in Madrid called Juan Lopez, and he's one of the founders of Familia Plomes, they have a type, an old press. And I took the letters that I got with me from Lebanon and we set it up and uh, we made some prints out of it. So now I have the, the rear lead letters. They were really damaged uh, through use, but um, these are different tests on different paper, on different uh, thickness. Um, so, so all of this is now coming together for me to start my own type project. So there's the photography of the matrices, there's the lead letters, there's the print that, like the real print that we did in Madrid, the scans of the test prints that were done in the 50s by Bertold, and the letter set sheet. And what I'm doing now is I'm comparing all of these materials, uh, before I compare materials, I want to thank all of these lovely people that really helped me to get all of this information. So from Lebanon, John and Nabil, from Germany, Dan, Kristen, Marcel, Ben, Teresa, Sam, and Till, and from Egypt, Bahia, and Haysam. Without their help, I wouldn't have been here speaking today about all of this information and sharing it with you. And what is the next season? Uh, it's my, now it's my turn to start the next season. So what, what, what would I do with all of this information? Like I have to give it life now. It's like, but I'm like this, this uh, idea is that, so this is not space, this is not uh, stars or any kind of uh, scientific. These are a super close up of the ha letter that uh, I started digitizing from the, so this is the upper part of the hat, lower part of the hat. So the idea is that um, I want to start a new typeface that is um, will be starting from the half bold of, of, of the design that Salim did, but it wants to be expanded into a huge super family. So it wants to expand to different weights, maybe different axes, doing it a variable font using the different technologies and all of that. So, so I started cleaning up some of the scans, uh, taking photos of what I have, uh, making the character set, uh, opening it in Glyph, putting it what I want to do, making research about the existing Nasikh typefaces and how, how this new Nasikh uh, modern typeface would compete with what is in the market now and what would be a good addition to what exists. So an example, this is the letter seen in Arabic. Uh, these are the four different shapes this letter can have depending on its position and word. Uh, this is a blown up version of the scene meteor form. And this is the outline that I'm drawing now. Uh, this is another example, the letter Hamza. Uh, also the outline above it, how it looks. This is Bertold in Arabic, Bertold, Bertold, they wrote it here. And this is how it, so I started with these letters now. So for now, I only have these letters present and all is to be done. So we remove the kashida to make it more clean. Sometimes they, put, they also wrote it birtold, not only birtold. 
So I want to design the typeface as if Salim is now creating number 49 using today's latest technology and type design. So I'm like, I want to be Salim now, like because I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by this guy, but I, I want to give all of this new technology to this typeface that I fell in love with. So this is Bertold in the letters that I drew now. I want to give an angle to the baseline, not to keep it flat, because during the 50s, the Arabic uh, script was simplified and the baseline was straightened. So I want to give it an angle to make it a bit more calligraphic. So I want to give it a two degree angle. I want to use the latest technology that is available in the Glyphs app for Arabic script, using, for example, the entry, the exit anchors, and other cursive uh, technology to make the connections. I want to use, of course, the top and bottom anchor to, uh, for the dots and the accents. And the lately added uh, uh, conditional or contextual anchors in glyphs uh, to remove uh, overlaps of dots and anchors with other letters. So for example, this is a code, this is an open type feature that uh, I would have uh, written, for example, to say that if a dot comes uh, after a letter of a ra of a wow, for it to be moved down from this anchor to, to the bottom one, for it to avoid overlapping with the letter ra or all of these I'm just showing a bit of that behind the scene of a type design word, uh, uh, just to, to 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 say that I want to take it to the to the latest technology present today, like the the best that I can use or I know to use nowadays. This is another technology that we call the elevation kerning, and um, uh, this is uh, uh, thanks to Toshi. Uh, I worked with him on a previous project called ADA, and he, he made this uh, elevation kerning technology that will make kerning even if the letters are going to be escalating. So this is going to also be implemented in this typeface. This is a bit of the coding behind it. Putting this coding makes me feel a bit of like this uh, uh, scientist behind the letters, but just like <laughs> coding. So this is an example also of contextual alternates. So in, in Arabic, it's not that every letter changes form, depending if it is in the beginning, in the middle, at the end, or isolated of a word. It can also change shape depending what comes before and after it. So here, for example, we're going to use contextual alternate to change, like this is the code of a contextual alternate. So for example, here you see the letter B, Y, R. So uh, the B, the Ya, and the Ra, and then we have the Ta and the Ha, but these letters, they will change to this shape if they come after each other. And, for, uh, and to do that, we need to do contextual alternates. So basically, uh, I'm going to use uh, glyphs and all the added uh, advanced plugins that come with this application. I'm going to use the latest uh, open type features that is present for the Arabic script, like uh, standard uh, and complex open type features, standard and contextual uh, anchor positioning, uh, standard and contextual and, and elevation kerning and other stuff. And so this is the what Salim designed in 55, or the digital version of what Salim designed. This is how I want to grow the family from only being half bold to be from light to black. So this is the weight axis in a variable font. And I want to add to it a contrast axis making it more like less contrasted. So if you want to compare it to, to a Latin, it's like taking a serif and making it a sans serif or something like that. And I want to make it into a variable font and it might still grow. So I'm still now starting the project. So hopefully in a year or two, you can check uh, 29LT website and you can see what happened with the typeface. But this would be also the variable font. For example, this is the letter wow with the axis of the weight and the contrast now, we might also add a rounded axis or a shadow axis. So this is the space of the design with the weight and the contrast. And this is how the actual idea for the type family is, but also it might grow. And uh, this is what I will be working for the coming two years maybe, or one year, and I will end with this lovely bird that we found in the, and the, and, the, and the letters, uh, just to say, hopefully there will be peace again in our world and we will be, have uh, better days ahead. Thank you so much.